A huge thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Hey everyone, Path here, and in this video I want to talk about one of the most central and yet most confusing ideas in quantum mechanics, known as the collapse of the wave function. If you enjoy this video then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. Let's begin by recalling that any system we study using the theory of quantum mechanics, maybe an electron in empty space, or maybe an electron and a proton making up a hydrogen atom, or anything else for that matter, can be described by a wave function. This is a mathematical function that tells us all the information we can know about our system. Most commonly, wave functions are discussed in the context of finding particles at different points in space when we make a measurement on our system. Here's what I mean by this. If we take our wave function for this particular particle, this electron, and we square it, technically we take its square modulus, then this directly gives us the probabilities of finding our particle in different regions of space. So in this case, from our wave function, we can see that the particle is most likely to be found somewhere here and less likely to be found here. That's how the wave function is most commonly discussed, but the wave function also contains other kinds of information. Basically, any measurement we can make, the wave function gives us the probabilities of getting any of the possible measurement results. For example, we may be familiar with the idea that in an atom, electrons can only occupy specific energy levels or shells. With the nucleus at the center of the atom, the shell nearest to the nucleus, called the first shell, is lowest in energy. The next shell up has slightly more energy, and then some more, and so on and so forth. But in other systems that aren't necessarily simple atoms, we can also see energy levels like this. A particle can be found in one of many different energy states, and the wave function squared gives us the probability of finding the particle in any one of these. Now, interestingly, quantum mechanics says that before we make a measurement to find out what state our particle is in, the system is not just already in that state, and we don't just simply find out what state it's in when we make the measurement. Quantum mechanics, or at least the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, says that the system is in all the possible measurement states at the same time. This is known as a superposition of states, and the wave function shows us that the system is in all these possible states, weighted by what is essentially the probability of finding it in any one of them. Now, this is obviously different to the system already being in a given state and then us just finding out what state it's in when we make a measurement. The interesting thing is, mathematically, these two ideas can be shown to have different consequences, which we can test in the real world with experiments. We can take each idea, put it into our mathematics, make a prediction from each one, and then test it. And we've already done this. And all of the experiments we've done so far suggest that this version, the superposition of states, is at the very least more correct than this version, where we just find out what state the system is in. For more information on this idea, I'll leave some resources in the description below. But why do we care about all this? Well, the point is that before we measure our system, it's in a blend of all possible states, but as soon as we measure it, it collapses into just one of these states, randomly. This idea is known as the collapse of the wave function. We have no way of predicting exactly which state our system will collapse into but if we repeat the same experiment over and over, then the kind of results we will get tend to match the probabilities given by our wave function. This makes sense because if there is 60% probability of getting this state in any one measurement, then if we make lots of identical measurements, 60% of these should be in this state. But the important thing is that we have no way of predicting which state a particular system will fall into before we actually make the measurement and find out. Now, there are a couple of things worth mentioning here. Firstly, physicists are still debating the details of what is meant by measurement. Some people hear this discussion we've just had about the collapse of the wave function and assume that this means we somehow control the universe because it's only after making a measurement that a system changes. However, as we said, the meaning of measurement is still slightly unclear in quantum mechanics, and it could also refer to interactions between different systems without the need for a conscious being doing the measuring. Secondly, 
Although we're looking at the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics in this video, it's worth noting that there are other interpretations which follow the same mathematics, but assign different physical meanings to each idea. They attempt to get around this random wave function collapse as well as the superposition of states, but are successful in some things and unsuccessful in other ways. Our main focus here will continue to be the Copenhagen interpretation or the most commonly used interpretation of quantum mechanics. And thirdly, let's talk about what happens to our system or to our wave function before and after the measurement. We've already seen that the process of making a measurement abruptly causes a somewhat random and unpredictable change in the system. But what happens before and after this measurement? Let's start with before. Remember how I said earlier that a quantum system is in a superposition of all possible measurement states? Well, that was a slight oversimplification. What actually happens is that a wave function follows what is known as the Schrodinger equation. This is one of the most important equations in quantum mechanics. It looks complicated, but all it tells us is how the wave function changes over time depending on the different energies in the system, whether that's kinetic energies or potential energies. I've made a whole video discussing the Schrodinger equation in a lot more detail. Check it out up here if you're interested. But anyway, it is entirely possible that the system is in a superposition of all possible measurement result states, as we said at the beginning, and that it stays this way over time as it doesn't change. Or it could be in some other superposition that evolves over time, or of course, many other scenarios, depending on how the system was set up in the first place, and as long as it follows the Schrodinger equation. What's important though, is that we can look at the wave function as it is at the instant in time, just before we make the measurement, and we can use that to calculate the probability of getting any particular measurement result when we do make the measurement. As we've already seen, once the measurement is made, there is a somewhat random and unpredictable collapse into one of the possible measurement states. And this depends on what the wave function looked like just before we made the measurement. This bit is not described by the Schrodinger equation and physicists are trying to understand it a bit better. They describe it as a discontinuous change because it suddenly collapses into one state rather than continuously flowing from one state to another. And then after the measurement, once again, the wave function starts following the Schrodinger equation at the instant in time after the measurement, based on now this being our initial state. So depending on the system and its surroundings, the system may just stay in this measurement state, or it may start spreading out back into a superposition of multiple states and evolve over time. It just depends on the exact scenario, but it still follows the Schrodinger equation at this point. Now, it's worth mentioning that this is all a basic description of wave function collapse based on a system where the possible measurement results are distinct states. When dealing with other systems that have a much more continuous set of measurement results, like the position of a particle, which could potentially be anywhere in a given region of space, rather than in specific fixed locations, then the collapse occurs into a few close by states, reflecting Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. That's a discussion for another video, however. Now, before we finish up, I want to take a moment to thank the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. Squarespace gives you a beautiful, powerful online platform from which to create your website. You can build a community on your Squarespace website with a fully integrated commenting system that supports threaded comments, replies, and likes. On top of that, you can easily display posts from your social profiles on your website. You can also connect with your audience and generate revenue through gated members only content. You can manage your members, send email communications and leverage audience insights as well, all on one easy to use platform. So if you're looking to very easily create a crisp, nice looking website, then head over to squarespace.com forward slash path G to get a free trial and to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com forward slash path G. Huge thanks to Squarespace once again for sponsoring this video. Anyway, with all this being said, I'm going to finish up here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Check out my merch linked down below. It features a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein, about which I made a video recently as well. And finally, I'd like to thank all of my Giga patrons and all of my other patrons over on my Patreon page. 
that's linked down below as well if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you very soon.